Marge Piercy, not recently published the paperback edition of Marge Piercy's 18th book of poetry, The Hunger Moon, New and Selected Poems. Other titles available in paperback include The Crooked Inheritance, The Moon is Always Female, and What Are Big Girls Made Of? Piercy has written 17 novels. Her most recent is Sex Wars. PM Press just reissued Dance, The Eagle to Sleep, Vida, and Braided Lives, with new introductions by the author. Her memoir is Sleeping with Cats from Harper Perennial. Piercy's work has been translated into 19 languages. She's given readings, speeches, and workshops at over 450 venues in the United States and abroad. In 2014, PM will publish Piercy's first collection of short stories, The Cost of Lunch, etc. Each June, she gives a juried intensive poetry workshop in Wellfleet. Please welcome Marge Piercy. You don't see surgeons. You don't read their email. They don't answer the phone. <laughs> <laughs> But once in a while, you have a brief vision of them. <laughs> oh, this is a, my book of short stories. And, uh, now, the one I'm going to first, I'm going to read you two of them. Uh, Saving Mother from Herself is the first one. Uh, if you have ever watched the program Hoarders on television. <laughs> my daughter Susie and my brother Abe, Adam really got after me about what they called my hoarding. I live alone. My husband died when he was just 58 of one of those heart attacks that hit without warning. He was playing golf, something he enjoyed but was never much good at, with another dentist and two podiatrists on Wednesday when he just keeled over on the fifth hole trying to bang his way out of the sand trap. <laughs> at first they thought he was kidding. I was only 50 then. I continued working, of course. I was a paralegal for 30 years in a small law office that did mostly real estate, wills, and probate. I was really as much a secretary as a paralegal, if I'm honest. But it wasn't taxing. I liked the men I worked for. You, and it paid decently, a middling, middle-class wage, you might say. Four years ago, I retired. Actually, they retired and closed the office. And at 59, I wasn't about to get hired to do anything better than greeting folks at Walmarts or banking at the supermarket. I had the insurance from Walt, and I put the CDs like my boss recommended. I had Walt's Social Security, which was better than mine. I was okay. The mortgage on our house we paid off decades ago. It was the same house where I raised Susie and my son Brady. <coughs> Brady's out in Arizona, so I only see him maybe every couple of years when he sends me tickets to fly out there. The last time was for my granddaughter Olivia's wedding. A very nice affair that must have sent him back. I can't imagine how much. I'll be a great grandmother before I can take in the fact that she may, get, get, may be pregnant. Makes me feel 90. Susie tried to get me to move into an apartment, but why? I'm used to this house. I know my neighbors, they know me. We don't hang out, but we keep an eye on each other's property and we have a friendly chat over the fence. I have a nice little garden out back and a two-car garage. This house has three bedrooms, so I have plenty of room for my things. That's what Susie and Adam object to, is if there's something wrong with liking bargains and pretty things and useful things other people throw away. If you ask me, people discard too many items nowadays. A rug that's still usable, even a flower pot sitting in a dumpster or out on the street waiting for the pickup. So I bring them home. I know I'll get some use out of them by and by. And books and magazines, perfectly fine to read. And VCR tapes. At garage sales, I can always find something interesting. When you live alone, you appreciate entertainment. I always have the TV on, even when I'm reading. It's company. So I collected. Who cares except my busybody daughter? And then she enlisted my older brother, who always used to try to boss me around before I married. He and his wife, Liz, she gives me a pain in the you-know-where. She's 
seems to feel superior because she never worked. So she stayed home and raised two kids, big deal. I worked and raised two kids and it turned, they turned out just fine. She always has her hair done and her nails too, as if at our age anybody gives a damn, excuse my language, what her nails look like and if they're pink or red or purple. I'm too busy to fuss about my nails. Long red talons would never survive one of my scouting trips. Besides, until Susie butted in, Liz and Adam had no idea about my hobby. We always met in the restaurant they paid. So what do I build up my dining room with my pines and the spare bedroom and all the, and the hall that leads to them and half the living room? <laughs> Who am I about to dine with anyhow? What do I need spare bedrooms for? In the living room, I store my reading material and VCR tapes and some extra VCRs people threw away. You can't buy a simple VCR no more. So I keep about a dozen spares for when they go. <laughs> I'm always watching for them because I have a library of almost a thousand perfectly good tapes I can watch whenever I choose. My daughter calls it a mess, but I have them all cataloged. Just ask me, I can pull out any show I want. Great old movies, some I saw and loved, others I never got a chance to see. Going to the movies used to be cheap, but now it's too rich for my purse. Why would I need to go to the movies anyhow with people nowadays being so rude and talking all through the movie and yakking on their cell phones? I have enough movies so I can see one whenever I choose. Now, isn't that luxury? It may look like a junkyard to Susie, but it just plain isn't, or rather wasn't. It isn't like Susie is over here much. She likes to call me every couple weeks and complain. I only hear from her when Brady has something to boast about. Oops, I didn't go. Ah. When she's heard from Brady who has something to boast about. I was just going along living my life, happy as could be, collecting and sorting and cataloging, collecting and storing all the useful things I might need later on. I'm not Bill Gates, you didn't think I'd know who he was, did you? So why should I ever have to buy what I can get free? Chairs, tables, lamps, cabinets, nice ornamental stuff like this stuffed owl I found. Where else would I ever get such a fine creature like Roscoe? Some people collect art or even stupid things like license plates or baseball cards, and nobody calls the feds on them. What's wrong with collecting useful things, I ask you? I feel bad for them, thrown out on the rubbish heap when there's still lots of life in them. Then there's my daughter yelling at me that I have a sickness. What are you talking about? I always get my flu shots at the senior center. <laughs> You're a hoarder. I saw it all on TV, she said. We have to get you help. Clutching my hand, super dramatic. We care for you, Mama, and we're going to make things right. What do I need help for? I'm doing fine. I'm happy. That's more than I can say for you. I meant it. Susie's <coughs> always complaining on the phone to me about her husband Ron's bad habits. He won't stop smoking. He leaves his underwear on the bedroom floor and his socks on the couch as if I want to know anything about Ron's underwear, give me a break. <laughs> she went on and on, but I tuned her out. If I hadn't learned to do that decades ago, I wouldn't be such a good-natured person, believe me. <laughs> but two weeks later, Susie showed up at the door with a woman, blonde in her 40s and wearing a navy suit. This simpering bitch was a therapist. <laughs> and she clumped her skinny behind down on my couch, which is sideways between the wall of books and scenes stacked neatly on, I'd say, on one wall and my entertainment section on the other wall, my 1,247 tapes. I only have about 10 inches of clearance between the couch and the entertainment section, but I can squeeze through. The therapist woman goes on about how hoarding is a disease, but it can be treated. Then my daughter chimes in that if I don't let them come into my house and take away all my wonderful things, she'll call elder services and have me moved into a home. For this, I raised her from a squalling baby and put her through community college and paid for her wedding. They had me over a barrel, so finally after three of these sessions with a woman who pretended to be on my side but never was, I agreed. She insisted on a tour of the house, making notes on her gizmo, talking into it. She checked the basement where I do laundry, the attic where I store stuff I don't need yet, and the garage with my car in it. 
It turned out that same TV program that my daughter had been watching that got me into trouble was going to come to my house and film everything. <laughs> they were going to clean up my house and make everything neat and orderly the way I surely wanted it. It wouldn't cost me a penny. They'd clear things out with my approval, of course, smirk. And with that threat hanging over my head the whole time, I was sweating by them with anxiety. When will all this be happening? She consulted her electric gizmo. We can schedule you for three weeks from today. The film crew will come in the day before. Then we'll have two days to clear out all this junk and clean your house and make it like new again. I know it'll be hard for you to adjust, but in the end, your house will be livable again. Livable? What have I been doing here? Dying? That gave me some time. I started moving my best stuff to the garage. At least I could protect that. I jammed the garage door opener so they couldn't get inside and moved my car to the driveway. The film crew came. They moved a lot of my stuff around to make it look messy. They pushed some of my stuff in the hall into my bedroom so I could barely reach my bed that night. I couldn't sleep facing the ordeal. Aside from when Walt died and when Brady had appendicitis and we just got him to the hospital in time, those two days were the worst of my life. They topped my first delivery when I was in labor for 20 hours. The time I broke my ankle tripping over my neighbor's dog. And the time Walt had food poisoning from some stupid mayonnaise chicken he ate at a picnic. Needless to say, I didn't make that. Adele Fortunata did, never forgave her. <laughs> They arrived early, the therapist, the cleaning crew, and muscle along with four huge semis parked. Junk Express. Junk, they called my stuff. I never picked up anything that wasn't useful. They were going to strip me bare. I had a stomachache. When therapist saw how upset I was, she took my hand as if it was a, I was a baby. She was leading out of danger. You need all these objects because you never properly processed your husband's death. It was so sudden and I expected you couldn't cope with the grief. You must let it out. You must experience your loss so you can let go of all these substitutes for him. The therapist sat down with me as they carried all my precious things out to the front lawn. The neighbors were gaping. I never read this down. I was supposed to pick through everything and save a few things. Whatever I picked, they said I was saving too much. The therapist kept talking about processing grief. She insisted she never, that I had never properly processed Walt's premature death, and according as she called it, was caused by that bunch of hooey. Process like can or freeze it? Walt didn't go collecting with me, but he liked this way. I, I was frugal and found things instead of spending our hard-earned cash on a chair or a vase or some good reading material. They couldn't understand how much pleasure I took in saving money and protecting good things that would otherwise end up at the dump. Finally, I agreed with everything. Susie cried and hugged me, and I pretended to cry with her. I really did manage to shed a few tears when I saw them carrying out the VCRs and the oriental rug I'd found rolled up, set out for the trash collector I'd planned to put down in my bedroom when I had time. I would saved four VCRs in the garage anyhow. <laughs> Now, what would you ever need six VCRs for? They don't even make them any longer. Don't you see how much room they take for no use? How many seats do you have, lady? She looked blank and stared at me. I don't know, maybe six? Why not just one? And how many lipsticks? She ignored that. Then I saw my stuffed doll Roscoe going out into the trash. I made a grab for him. Now, why on earth would you want a dusty, mangy old stuffed doll? I lied. I said, it belonged to my husband. <laughs> it's a poor substitute for him, isn't it? Can you remember him without something probably full of dust and insect eggs? I love Brasco. His yellow eyes looking at me from the mantle. I made another grab for him, but Susie held me down in the chair. The therapist said, if it bothers you so much, we can send some to the resale shop. The crew, along with Susie, was dividing all my property and things to be dumped and items to go to a resale shop. I found out which one. Oh. <laughs> I could have tried to find out where they were tra where they were, the stuff they were trashing was going, but I am not a garbage picker, and those places stink. I counted my losses, but I bore with them. I had no choice. 
my lovely oak book bookcase, my gilt elephant with a hood on top, waltz golf clubs, a round mirror with only a little damage to the left side, three platters in the shape of fish, a tin of buttons, straight chairs that just needed a little work. I imagine running away to Florida or Mexico or Puerto Rico when they were, were done to escape scrutiny, but I have my house and I know my way around here, so I sat in the lawn chair and picked through my treasure and watched them disappear. They kept stealing my things and carting them off, and I had to sit there and smile for the cameras and listen to that simpering therapist bulldog. Inside, I was boiling, but I'm not stupid no matter what they think. They had the upper hand for now. Finally, they restored my home to what it had never looked like all the years I lived there. <laughs> Raised my ungrateful children, been married and happy with Walt, made a life for myself that satisfied me. The therapist set up an appointment with me for some other meddler. I promised I would go. I could sit through more bulldung if that would get them off my back. Adam and Liz had decamped before the last truck rode off with my things inside. They had a fundraiser to attend for some private school. Finally, Susie, who'd hung around to the bitter end, bitter for me, left telling me how wonderful the house looked. At last, they were all gone, relatives, therapists, muscle men, cleanup crew, and trucks. I sat in my boring living room with only the TV for company, a single bookcase of books they'd agreed to leave me, one VCR and 10 tapes. The dining room was set up for company who would never arrive. At least they cleaned everything. It does tend to get dusty, but I don't have allergies. How would you like a bunch of strangers to invade your house, take three quarters of your possessions away, tell you what you're supposed to think and feel, all of which was being filmed so anybody in the country could gape it? I felt humiliated. I felt violated. And they kept saying how nice it was now and expecting me to thank them. The next morning, I brought my few saved treasures from the garage into the house. It still felt bare and lonely. My house and I were robbed, pillaged. Monday, I went to the bank and withdrew $500 in cash. Then I rented a U-Haul and headed for the resale shop. <laughs> I figured after three days, they'd have my stuff out. I recognized 23 pieces of mine, so I bought them back. I told the lady I was furnishing a condo. When I unloaded my stuff into my house and set everything up, it was still barren, but at least I had a few things to look at and use, like that easy chair. The maroon upholstery was worn, but it was comfy. Some of the glassware and dishes I'd collected. My extra china closet I'd begin to fill. The nice table with the inlaid chessboard. A few cracks didn't spoil it. The stuffed owl put back on the mantel. Welcome home, Roscoe. Two salad bowls, I like wood. Two end tables, I can always use end tables. Another bookcase. It was a humble beginning, but better than they'd left it. I had the lock changed on Susie's, so she couldn't come barging in. I found some thick drapes at a different resale shop, so she couldn't see in any longer from the porch. I've learned to protect myself. They won't catch me again. I went to the therapist, a man this time, but just as opinionated and misguided as that lady. I parroted what they expected me to say. I'm not stupid. He said he was very pleased with my progress. <laughs> Every weekend I search for yard and garage sales and slowly I'm collecting things that make my life worthwhile. Treasures others have abandoned that I can enjoy. My home is beginning to feel like mine again and full of objects I've rescued. The month before last I was on TV and had to lay low for a while. The show was just as humiliating as the experience itself. They made my home look disgusting. I found an auburn wig in a consignment shop I put on to go hunting for gardens. <laughs> if people stare at it, I say I had chemo, and they shut up. <laughs> I know people will forget the show shortly. There was a major man on half the show who collected as many toys and stalls he couldn't get into his bathroom. I've never had trouble going to mine. I love to take baths. People nowadays discard memories as fast as they discard perfectly good objects. But here I am ready to save what shouldn't be thrown on the trash heap like this old woman and many another. I'm gradually getting my life back the way I like it. I'm settling back into my home.
have trouble opening it. Like those medicine bottles that only five-year-olds can open. <laughs> uh, a number of the, of the stories are marked with a date. It's not the date they were written, but when I set them. This one is 1960, Do You Love Me? Oily night pads in, the house reeks, but it's chilly in the room under the eaves of the townhouse where they pitch in bed. To her, Edmund feels all spines. He penetrates her like a question and she responds with her hips nervously. I don't know if I love you, Edmund, whom nobody calls Ed, is sitting on the bed's edge, thinner than ever. She shivers with sweat. Should I leave, go back to New York? Of course not, politely. Don't be melodramatic. It's worse since we started sleeping together. Worse? He shoots to his feet, reaching for his briefs. What's worse? It's enough to make anyone nervous, tiptoeing around my parents' house. Why do we stay here then? Let's go someplace else. But you said you liked them. Well, I do, especially your father. He's a dear. He winces, misbuttoning his shirt, waits for her to help him. In his angular face, the gray eyes are set wide. They look past her, anticipating his flight down to the second floor. Tossing on the cot after he has left, she hears dry voices, the ticking of glib excuses of the men who have borrowed and used her. Her fingers scrape the sheets. She is 23 and he is 28, an instructor who was her section man in philosophy when she was in college, but she is his instructor in bed. She shares herself with him as a winning argument, but he takes her gingerly and afterwards as if she were something he had stepped in. After she graduated, they had run into each other in the coffee house she still frequented. They went out from time to time last winter and spring evenings he'd taken her, and spring evenings that he had taken more seriously than she had. People said she was pretty. She danced well. There were always men. She had been astonished when he proposed she spend the summer with him at his parents' home. He said they would learn a great deal about each other without being committed to anything, that she would like Boston and find their home comfortable. He was thinking about marriage that amazed her. Therefore, she did not say no, but maybe. She took him home with her by way of testing, but learned little except that he settled easily into a placid boredom. Her photographer boyfriend dumped her for a moneyed girlfriend with a loft in Soho. She stayed with friends, then other friends sleeping on lumpy couches. She had imagined being an editor, making the delicate literary decisions she'd been taught in college, but she was asked if she could type. She found a job so boring she would sometimes think she would die at her desk in the long mornings and longer afternoons. They started to talk to her about dressing differently, she called Edmund in Boston. Now the house encloses her like an elbow. The house is so busy with a hundred concealed pursuits and escapes as a forest. His father talks to his motherly, to his mother. His father talks to his mother. His mother talks to the black maid. She and the mother give each other little electric shocks. The father is okay, scotch and water, the main woods and hunting season, the local globe and the New York Times, and a blown wistfulness in his thick face. The mother is tall and dry. She seems to move with the sound of, with the sound of tissue paper. Coming into Edward's, Edmund's territory, she finds that whether they are to marry, whether he wants to, grows every day bigger and bigger. She rests in his hands like something inert. Edmund lies in his ivory bedroom. He turns his cheek against his special firm pillow, drifting through his melancholy love for his married cousin, Isabel. Roses and waxy green paper, Limoges china, something soothing as his mother's hands for in childhood fevers. He feels her in her attic room pressing down on his head. Why did he bring her here? Often he cannot remember. Sometimes she resembles his dreams of the girl who will belong to him, but sometimes she grates. 
He is amused to think she was born in a western where names are jokes, the town of Dog Leg Bend, where dust shimmies in the streets under a sky of mercury. Once he went there with her. Her waitress mother, fat and messy, greeted her without surprise. Her younger sister seized her and they remained closeted for hours. She spoke to no one in the streets. She took him around a maze of overgrown fields and sway-backed houses, playing guide as if there were something to see. That's where we lived the year I was 10. That's where my sister Jeannie and I used to fish on the sandbar. That's where the Massey boys caught me when I was coming from the diner and when I yelled, they jumped up and down on my stomach. That's where I saw a wounded goose in fall when they come over. He has brought her to his family as a well-trained retriever will bring something puzzling to lay at his man's feet and wait expectant. Is it good? Do we eat it? By breakfast time, the heat has begun to see, to rise, seeping into the shuttered windows. His, her face cool from sleep across the English marmalade and muffins and yesterday's flowers seems young again, closed into itself. He wants to touch her. His hearty father makes a joke about their wan morning faces. His mother suggests with buttery kindness that the girl's dress is somewhat short for the street. All eyes pluck at the seams of bright, true bright, cotton. Do they know? Their hopeful politeness enwraps him. Yes, they would be glad to spread her on the, that maid's cot to serve her up to ensure that he is whole and healthy. His mother has always read books on mind repairing. Son, I want you to feel free to bring your friends home. Remember, you have nothing to be shy about. I've asked Nancy Bateman, you know, the Bateman's adorable younger daughter, to dinner Friday. He says, Mother, Father, we're going to the cottage for a week. It's too hot here. Her eyes leap from their private shade, but she only takes more jam and teases his father. He knows in deep thankfulness she, will, she is pleased and will reward him with an easy day. She will take his wrist in a hard grip and pull him off to play together, to play tourists in his own city. All day she will ask nothing. All day she will turn them into magic children from the story. He wants to push away from the table and hurry out with her. They go to the cottage. Coming back from the crossroads store with groceries, she looks at him beside her. She cannot imagine marriage, but she knows it is what makes a woman real, weighs her to a name and place. That safe feeling she would seek walking in the old cemetery, names and dates neatly grouped in families, even the little babies accounted for. She'd wanted to get away from Dog Leg Bend as long as she can remember. But being a secretary is no better than being a waitress, except that her back and feet hurt less and her eyes hurt more. He says, I thought you'd be more struck by the townhouse. We're proud of the wood paneling on the staircase. It dates from 1830. But all houses impress her. All other dogs have equally big bones. Walking beside him, she catches her breath as they come over a hill and the ocean stretches out in the haze. She is surprised again by how tall the ocean is, how much sky it uses up. That blue yawn is her future. She will drown. The cottage squats on the last dune facing the sea. She puts down the groceries and sits at the white sea blistered table. She sits still with concentration. On the table are shells and pebbles she has been collecting. She says without inflection, I pack my suitcase. I saw you. Why? How can you leave? There's a bus that stops on the highway at 410. The woman at the crossroads store told me so. Why? Where do you want to go? You quit your job. She lays out the pebbles in circles. You don't want me to stay enough. He sees himself returning to the city without her. The air will prickle with questions. Suppose after she leaves, he changes his mind and realizes he wants her. Where will you be? Her travel-worn suitcase with wheels that squeak stands at the door. She picks sand from the ribs of a scallop shell. New York? Oh, maybe I'll go. Maybe I'll go to California. 
Choosing a place so idly makes him dizzy. He sees her blown off like a grasshopper. People cannot just disappear. By yourself, his tedious jealousy of tedious young men. She smiles, her heart is chipping at her ribs. The road comes over the last stone fitted to its curved flank and a question mark. She does not dare turn from him to go inside and look at the clock. Will she really have to go? Will she have to get on that dirty bus and use up her last few dollars on a cheap motel? She concentrates on his bent head. Want me, want me, damn you. She is not sure how much money she has in her purse and wishes she had counted it in the bathroom. He is staring at his knuckles, big for the thinness of his hands and bone colored with clenching. Do you love me? She turns her head, her gaze strikes into his with its clinking, the stirring of a brittle wind chime. He is thinking about girls, the difficulty, the approaching, his shyness, the awkward phone calls with silences that open under him like crevasses in a glacier. She is wondering what she's supposed to say. What do you care? I have to know, he says. His long, milky face, pleading laugh, set of mismatched bones. He is gentle. He does not touch her with passion, but neither does he hurt her. That is very important, not to be hurt. Of course I love you. Do you? Once again, he ducks to stare at his knuckles. She must risk breaking the tension. She goes to read the clock. What time is it, he calls. He comes back to answer, five to four. I hope I haven't forgotten anything. The strand of hair in the wash basin, steel hands press on his shoulders, decide, decide. His father's voice rising with the effort to contain his temper. Squeeze the trigger, Redmond, squeeze it, come on. It won't wait for you all day, do it. The rabbit bolted into the tall grass. In his relief, he shot, his father strode away. Be a man, be a man, pressure of steel hands. He has always been fastidious not to give pain. Let's walk down to the water, he says. She shakes her head. Not enough time, I can't miss the bus accidentally, don't you see? In New York, it will be hot. She will call somebody, she will sleep on a couch, and the next day she will go around to the temp agencies in whatever is still clean. Men will pester her on the street. Men will buy her supper and expect to lay her as pavement. I can't sit here any longer waiting for you to decide if you love me, can I? She slaps the sand from her palms, hating herself for having listened to his quiet voice, for having been given her, for having given herself into his hands like a bag of laundry. He cradles his head, elbowing aside the shells and pebbles. They move him. The sort of treasures a child might hoard. He feels wrong, not sure why. He hates the carelessness of men like his father, men in the fraternity of his college years whose act of power is given to give pain. He does not know what he wants, only that everything is going away. She's about to walk off with that flimsy suitcase and leave him tangled here. She reads his face, sullen, puzzled. He will let her go. Her skin crawls, one more defeat. Well, want to walk me to the crossroads? It's time. But he does not rise. Stay. Hope scalds her. She wants one so badly that surely she must win. Why let it drag on? You know it's hard for me to figure out what I want sometimes. I'm slow to react. I can't just decide like that. She says, you can tell if you love me. You could tell you wanted me here for the summer. He is afraid, but of what, her leaving? But I do love you, he breaks from his chair, snatches the suitcase from her. I do love you, I want us to stay together. The words slam like a door he's finally through. He feels weak with relief, he's done the right thing. He too will have a wife. He will have a wife and children with his name. Then I'll stay, she stands quite still. The blue future gathers itself in a wave and comes crashing over her. I've won, she tells herself. Now I'll be safe, now I'll belong, and I'll be ever so good to him. I'll never take another bus. 
I'll never sleep on somebody else's couch again. But her spine is water and her hands curl up remembering the vertical house, his parents with their expectant eyes, his ivory bedroom with its air of sick room. His thin arms fold around her in a tight but formal embrace like an upended box. Oh. It's a pretty book. It's one of my prettiest books. <laughs> Most of my prose and fiction isn't very pretty. Poetry is because I get involved. This is the first time I've actually really liked to cover except for sex wars. Okay, I'm supposed to do questions, whatever. <laughs> I can't see you. Is there any way to have house lights? So I can see people? Ah, uh, nice. You're actually real. <laughs> do, do, don't raise your hands. It's not classy. If you have anything to ask or say, just stand up and do it. The, the two stories I read are very different, and the rest of them are all very different, too. They're very different stories, <laughs> can I say. A couple of them are in the first person. Uh, they range a whole lot of different subjects. Uh, uh, oh, a woman in the anti-war movement of the 60s taking a deserter across the border into Canada. Uh, uh, the, the last one is called, How to Seduce a Feminist or Not. <laughs> and it, it goes through 70s, 80s, 90s. <laughs> uh, just... I have, yeah, I have a question. Um, has your writing, I know you have, like, I don't know, 17 or 19 novels. Has your writing, writing gotten... 17 novels, not 19. Wonderful. Has your, the writing process gotten any easier for you as you've gone on, would you say, or how would you describe that? Uh, it's... Uh, a few of these stories were old, but most of them I wrote for the book. And it was hard to get back into writing short stories again, but I enjoyed it a great deal. I, th I decided that I actually, at this point in my life, I get better than novels. <laughs> it's, it's, not the, it's so much more immediate. But no, you're always trying to do more. So uh, things, certain things get easier. Uh, you learn pacing. You learn how to do characterization. You learn the uses of dial of dialogue. You learn, you know, your craft. Craft gets easier because you learn it. But tackling things somehow, getting into it, getting at what you really want to do with it, that never gets easy. Uh, it's it, poetry is the same way. The, uh, your craft you learn. You can all, that's all you can ever teach is craft. Uh, so you learn your craft and you become more and more a master of it. But what you're trying to do is always new. This isn't really a question, but maybe there's a question. Somebody will find a question in there. I was totally blown away at the difference in tone between those two stories. Well, they're different women. Yeah. At different points in their life. For me, I always believe that the style in fiction has to come out of the character or characters you're writing with. How do you do that? Voice. It's, it's voice. Her voice is very different. The unnamed girl is very different voice than the woman uh, who's 58 and, and uh, you know, on quarters. <laughs> it all, I'd like to think that most of the stories have a different voice. Because I try to get into the characters and the voice comes out of them. I guess what I really meant to say is how, and I'm, I'm just astonished at how well you do that. Well, thank you. That, that was impressive. Well, if I would have read a third story, it would, it would have been very different indeed. <laughs> when did you write the second story? Uh, I did a version of it many years ago, but the actual writing of it was uh, about, oh, 
probably 10 months ago. Can you talk about how feminism informs your writing? Oh, everything informs my writing. I'm a feminist, I'm a lefty, I'm a, I'm a woman. I come from a working class, stone working class background. I grew up in center city of Detroit in a predominantly African American neighborhood. All of these things inform my writing. I don't make a distinction. I'm a Jew, I'm a practicing Jew. All these things inform my writing. But it feels like you, your two stories are so different and yet, and I have to tell you, small changes my life. So I, I, mean, I felt like your second story felt a lot like small changes to me. But well, wait, I didn't get the last sentence. The second story felt f familiar in that small changes kind of character, kind of way. Yeah. And, but I felt like both stories have a feminist point of view. That Of course. That morning woman is fighting for independence in, some, in the same way I think your second character is, is thinking about love and independence very gendered way. Well, the, the first story is a lot about independence. Uh, her wanting to preserve her independence, her choices, <laughs> and her sense of herself as something the society uh, discards, and uh, her sympathy with objects that are discarded. In your new book, are any of your characters male? There, there was a boy, um, Edmund. <laughs> 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 Can you think of one of the story is their story, that they are the speakers, really? Because that story wasn't really Edmund's story. I no, no, it's not really Edmund's story. Uh, I, when I was first trying to get published, I learned to write Veil Viewpoint because that's the only way I could get published then. Uh, so I've, and I've done it a lot of times. But this book is mostly about women, women's experiences. You talked about finding their voice. Is there a whole backstory that you create for the characters that doesn't appear in the stories that you create so that when you speak mm. for them? That you can yeah. Yeah, I have to know the characters very thoroughly before I can write the story. I had no, she had a close relationship with her sister. Etc. Uh, those are things I had to know to write the story. I have to know the characters. I can't find a voice for somebody I don't know. Do you have to like them? No. There's a story called The Shrine uh, in which the viewpoint character, uh, when it was, it was reviewed, it was in a, published in uh, uh, December magazine was just recently revived after, what, 30 years or something. And that story was in it, and the person reviewing it said I created this wonderful villain. <laughs> do you find the characters, or do they find you? Uh, I find them. <laughs> no, nothing comes to she who sits and waits. <laughs> character, you can't make them do things they don't want to do. Uh, if, if you, 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 you can't violate them in that way. You're the, you want to plot and you want them to do this, well they don't want to do that. <laughs> Tough. <laughs> they do take on a life of their own. Well, sort of. What's it like when you choose the third person's point of view as in sex wars? Um, and whose voice is that, the narrator? Well, there's, in Sex Wars, there's a number of voices. There's Elizabeth Cady Stanton. Uh, there is uh, the, the Jewish immigrant who makes the condoms in her kitchen. That was a women's occupation after uh, the balkanization of rubber was available. Uh, and there's also Victoria Woodhull. And then there's Anthony Comstock. Now, there I got into somebody I hate, but I managed to get into him. Uh, a number of critics were astonished at the fact that he works as a character. 
But you did use third person. I mean, there was yeah, the, uh, the, the, other, the second story I read is in third person. I usually work in third person. Uh, sometimes I work in first, but you know, you find it. I've had myself beginning a novel in first person or third and discovering that wasn't the way to go after about five chapters and going back and starting over. There's a, there's a, there's a way to tell a, a story with a particular character. You want to be inside her, the, the hoarder. You've got to be in her, or you're making fun of her. So in a sense, it has to be I. Could you talk some more about your writing process? Do you discipline? Do you do it every day? Look, what does a plumber do? <laughs> Don't be romantic about writing. It's a job. Right. Right. Uh, yes, I read every day because electric bills come in and uh, the, the oil, the propane I have to pay for, and the oil, the furnace, especially this winter. Oh, God. Oh, I like writing. Uh, I'm glad that I'm able to, to make some kind of living out of it because I like doing it and all the other things I did in my life, which was many before I started making a living from writing, were not things I particularly <laughs> wanted to do. Do you write poetry and fiction at the same time? Not the same day. Okay. Uh, it, 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 the, the one day is either poetry or fiction. But I'm always doing both, especially poetry. It's amazing how successful you are in both, in both genres. A lot of women work in more than one genre. The pressure on us isn't to specialize nearly as much as it is on men. I mean, I've written memoir, I've, I've worked on a, uh, wrote a play, uh, I've written an essay, I have a book of essays that'll be out next year. Uh, I've fiction, short stories, poetry. It's fun to try different genres. Besides, it has a wonderful advantage. You get stuck on one, you move to the other. <laughs> you, get on some, you don't get writer's block. Do you find that uh, you have an idea that begins in one of those genres and then uh, you find it's not working there and switch over and turn it into the other? You can't mistake an elephant for a crow. <laughs> Similarly, you can't mistake the, an idea for a novel for an idea for a poem. Well, I think I'm thinking more of a short story versus a poem. No, they're different. All my fiction is very character-centered. Uh, one of the things that fascinates me is other people. I'm a very nosy person. Uh, and you know, I'm one of those writers who eavesdrops. <laughs> so uh, so the, in fiction, I'm very interested in other people's lives. There are a few of the stories in uh, the volume of short stories that are autobiographical, but very few. I'd say maybe three or four. Um, your comment just a minute ago when you said women have to work in more time. Than men. What's your? I mean, I don't know, what's your understanding about women? Understanding about what? About why women are have, have to uh, write more broadly in different genres. We don't have to, but we can. We don't feel the same pressure to specialize. And it's wonderful to do so. What's your understanding though? Why men have that pressure, or why? I think that men are more competitive and that when they get into something, they, most of them, and you know, any generalization about men, women always has about 40% exceptions. <laughs> How much of your writing is in your revision process? Can you describe that? An enormous amount of it. Uh, that last story I read, I cannot tell you how many drafts that went through. It kept getting shorter, shorter, shorter. It started this way, it ended up this way. I kept cutting what I didn't think I needed. So you put them down and then go back to them later and, 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 and revise and change, you know, like over a period of time? 
Yeah, that's what you do with writing. Once in a while, something will come entire and it's done. But mostly, no. Uh, there's a famous story about a Boston Brahmin woman who wrote who, in the middle of the night, she woke up and she realized the secret <coughs> of the universe. And she wrote it down. In the morning, she wrote, she found she'd written, Hogamous, pogamous, woman's monogamous, hagamous, pigamous, man's most polygamous. <laughs> <laughs> Occasionally, you will have a poem that comes, uh, especially poems that come as a dictated. I have never written a story that didn't need revision. Ever, ever, ever. So maybe we can take the last question so we have some time for the silence. How do you feel about these book readings? <laughs> I didn't hear that. What did you say? How do you feel about these book readings and the book tours? Is this something that you enjoy or something, the, something that I enjoy? What? The book readings and, and the book touring. Oh, uh, they don't send you on book tours anymore if you're mid-list. Uh, <laughs> uh, and uh, I, I love reading. I love giving readings. I hate travel now, especially if you have to do it by plane. With my cyborg knee, oh boy. They, they, they think it's a bomb. <laughs> <laughs> Flying has become so unpleasant. But I love reading, giving readings. I like performing it, the work. I like the work, I like performing it. I'm not embarrassed about it or ashamed of it. I'm proud of the work I've done. <laughs>